My name is Joseph Wunderlich. I'm a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. This is a second lecture in a series of lectures on Frank Lloyd Wright. We go very fast through these. I expect all students to come back and look at them, uh, go down, look at the links, and read a little slower through this than we're going to go through in this narration. This is the second part of the lecture series that covers uh, ages 20 to 33, from 1887 to 1900. Uh, this is when uh, architects are getting jobs, many jobs, right after uh, the Great Chicago Fire, so there's many opportunities there. Uh, then he has his wife, Kitty, uh, meets her very young. She's only 16, and then when they're eight, she's 18, they marry. They both uh, have, uh, then they have five children together. Uh, his mentors um, are mainly Joseph Silsby, and then uh, Louis Sullivan is a, a huge influence on him. Uh, and then uh, Oak Park is where he's uh, living, and he builds his home and studio uh, with a loan from Louis Sullivan, private loan, even though he's working for him. And then this is where Frank Lloyd Wright begins his organic architecture, or the roots of it. Uh, these are the majority of the references that I've used for these, uh, uh, this lecture series, and uh, they're worth taking a look at each of them individually if, when you have time. A uh, quick review of part one. So let's recall his earliest influences up until age 19. Uh, his mother and father, certainly, and a Unitarian family and the farmland he grew up in. Uh, his mother's teaching using the Froebel methods and Froebel uh, long before Frank Lloyd Wright was was even born uh, developed in Germany these these methods and uh, he himself was influenced by Asian things as Frank Lloyd Wright would later be so there's two connections to some of the Asian Asian influences and in philosophy uh, that you could see in Frank Lloyd Wright's work. His father was a musician, and that's what he ended up being most well known for and publishing. And then Frank Lloyd Wright would have music uh, um, in his um, school that he eventually opened in the fellowship and would put, uh, um, would put uh, pianos and many of his designs. Uh, now, Maria Montessori is shown here in parallel, um, but she did not directly influence Frank Lloyd Wright because she uh, was not of age to do that yet. She she did her developments in, in parallel to the time Frank Lloyd Wright did, but she was also influenced by Froebel methods. And so I have uh, you know, this future designers um, parallel paths there with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and uh, Maria Montessori. So the main influences here until age 19 was Wisconsin, a little bit of New England as his father moved around looking for preaching work. Uh, of the architects that he had uh, was uh, as mentors was Alan Conover at the time he was at the University of Wisconsin uh, in the science building there. And then uh, Joseph Silsby on his, uh, worked with him uh, on the Unity Chapel. Uh, events, the uh, post-Civil War, he was born, the Industrial Revolution was going on, his parents unfortunately got divorced. Uh, then resulting principles that he came away with from his childhood, uh, uh, a love of music and relating it to architecture, also the wood block geometries, the simple geometries, and his um, later organic architecture that he would be developing uh, was rooted in some of this, the Unitarian belief system, love of nature, uh, and some of the things that we saw in the science hall uh, uh, with the organic design um, <clears throat> principles. So Frank Lloyd Wright moves to Chicago when he's 20 years old. He pawns some things of his father and mother to get a train ticket ride. And then that there's a fire that just happened prior to him getting there. So all the buildings are being rebuilt. There's plenty of work for young architects. He initially works for Joseph Silsby. Uh, that he had previously worked with. Here's a first project here of a private school, um, a progressive private school, one of the first co-ed boarding schools by his aunts. 
Uh, Silsby was also a friend of the family, too, so that's how he got his first work. Then, a uh, very important mentor, he approaches uh, Louis Sullivan, and he loved that he was uh, the way he, he thought and really wanted to work with him. Um, Louis Sullivan was mostly a commercial versus residential home building. He was a commercial architect, high rises, uh, known as the father of high rises. Uh, a number of very popular buildings, some of the early high rises, auditorium building, Chicago, Wainwright building, St. Louis. 705 Oliver Building, St. Louis, uh, the Guarantee Building. And so Franklin Wright was uh, worked on some ornamentation on the high rises, but soon worked mostly in residential projects, was, which was not a big part of the firm. So they let him take that over. Uh, after a while, he worked his way up. Uh, he rose to chief draftsman in charge of 49 others. Uh, he would refer to Louis Sullivan as his Liebermeister, the dear master. <clears throat> He was uh, given a five-year contract, and then, I uh, have it read here, at age 22, asked Louis Sullivan for a personal loan to build a house, and he got one. I also met his wife, Catherine Tobin, who was 17. He met her when he was 21 at a church social. Uh, they were soon married, had six children. Um, <clears throat> over 13 years. And so Louis, uh, Franklin Wright is now in charge of residential projects and partly to pay back the loan, the personal loan from Louis Sullivan. Uh, they had in common that neither one of them liked neoclassicism, the uh, Greek and Roman styles that you can see in this picture here. Uh, the World, Chicago World's Fair went on uh, around or at 1893. Neither one of them liked it, Franklin Wright criticized it as uh, with quoting this French poet saying, it's the setting sun all mistook for dawn. Uh, so it was a big trend for everybody to do neoclassicism. Uh, neither Franklin Wright nor Louis Sullivan uh, liked it. They wanted a whole new American architecture. Uh, he did, however, like the Japanese, Franklin Wright liked the Japanese pavilion that he saw at this World's Fair in Chicago, a replica, in, a replica of the ho o -den Phoenix Hall in Japan. Uh, he was also very interested in Japanese woodblock prints and would have a, a, quite a rich uh, understanding of uh, Japanese culture and art from an early age. This is the real um, or the actual Phoenix Hall in Kyoto. I had a chance to visit Japan in 2013, saw many sites. Unfortunately, I didn't see this one in Kyoto. Uh, there's 60 sites. We did spend a week and a half in Kyoto. I should have taking the time to go to this one. <clears throat> uh, this is what uh, the Phoenix Hall replica looked like in 1893 World's Fair. Franklin Wright seeing this when he's 26 years old. Uh, he's noticing the open floor plan in there, which he will later become well known for in America. Uh, also Japanese screens, and he uses those in some of his designs early on, uh, common in the Japanese architecture. Another picture of Japanese architecture. So we're going to focus a little bit now on some of the simple geometries you can see in Frank Lloyd Wright's work. This is his home that he borrowed money from Louis Sullivan to build, a personal loan. And uh, you can see the four blocks on the left here that we saw in an earlier lecture. Uh, also, this uh, video log I'll be referring to and I want you to watch parts of later on. Uh, this is a video log lecture of 31 Frank Lloyd Wright sites that I visited in and around uh, Chicago, including Oak Park, where Frank Lloyd Wright got his early start. This is on my YouTube channel. Uh, this is an excellent tour guide, very knowledgeable Chicago native, giving us a tour of his home, of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's home. And this is the entry for and main stairs, the second floor. This is the fireplace hearth. Uh, typically, Frank Lloyd Wright put the fireplaces in the middle of the building. The chimneys were big, wide chimneys, in the, uh, typically in the middle of buildings. And uh, you can see the strong geometries uh, of this fireplace. Octagons here uh, of these, it's hard, a little bit hard to see. You can see it in plan view. Uh, but the banding of windows we're going to also talk about quite a bit here. A signature Frank Lloyd Wright, 
the living room. This is the dining room. Another picture of the dining room and the banding of windows and the breaking up of the box. This is the only bathroom for everybody in the house, including the six children, uh, but it's very nicely lit with natural lighting. This is a picture I took. You could see the light coming in indirectly around this little alcove of a south facing south facing window. It also provides privacy. Here's the master bedroom. Another picture of the master bedroom. Tall ceilings, geometric shape of the ceiling. This is a nursery. This is the children's bedroom with the boys on one side and the girls on the other. It was initially his uh, studio space. Then he started building a studio addition for himself and his employees. Uh, this is where you come in the front entry and you review plans with the clients. Tour guide showing that how that worked. This is where the secretary sat at the entry. This is the main studio space and one of the drawing tables. And this is my son. That's actually a safe in the background where they kept things. You see uh, one of these also in the, uh, in the Roby house down from near the University of Chicago. We'll talk about later. Uh, it's a two-story open atrium uh, in the studio space, letting in very nice natural lighting and then this quote uh, part of it says it's uh, by rudyard kipling uh saying uh, saying now mark my word we'll build the perfect ship now the playroom edition this is a very interesting space you can see a balcony up above where the children would put on plays up front and uh, the parents and guests would sit up in the balcony there was a piano built into the wall and there's a stairwell going down behind the playroom and you can see the piano up above and it actually allowed the music to flow through the house as well as uh, efficient use of space. In this slide you can see the fireplace in the playroom and the influence of the geometric shapes of the foible blocks of his youth. Here you can see the tour guide pointing at a collection of affordable blocks. It's another picture of those. And from another angle. Here's the barrel vault. You can see the simple geometry of that. Let's take a look at some simple geometries in uh, designs by other architects. This is a barrel vault in uh, what was a chapel in Windsor, England, near Windsor Castle, actually Old Windsor. It was in a board, boys boarding school that was converted into a hotel that we stayed in. Here is a barrel vault in Kyoto, Japan uh, in 2013. Uh, the previous one was 2014 in, in, in England, Windsor. This one's 2013. Uh, in Kyoto, Japan. You can take a look at the brickwork there. Very detailed. This barrel vault is in Germany, in Zell, Germany in 1992, a long time ago, uh, where my wife and I visited Zell, Germany. Now let's take a look at some more geometric elements. So, Details in Frank Lloyd Wright's houses. These are eyebrow windows in the bedrooms of the children in his home and studio in Oak Park. Uh, now maybe consider it for your own design. So this is uh, something I did in my Pennsylvania residence. You can see the eyebrow window. Here's a more close-up view of uh, from the interior bedroom, one of the bedrooms. Uh, and this is from a lecture here that I encourage you to come back and click on this lecture on interiors in a materials and methods course uh, that I taught. And you can see that on my YouTube channel. 
Now let's take a look at some strong, uh, simple geometric shapes used by Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, some samples throughout his career, even though we're fo focusing here uh, on his early life. Uh, let's look at some at later stages in his life. So you see here at age 22, the uh, influence of the triangular shape, strong geometric, simple geometric shape. Uh, then at age 26, the octagon and these uh, what are called bootleg houses we'll talk about in a minute. Those towers or octagon in uh, plan view. This is a strong, uh, simple geometric shape of a square, of a cube in the Unity Temple. Very famous design of Frank Lloyd Wright in 1905 when he's 38 years old. Uh, you can see more on this. So this slides from my lecture series on architecture theory. That's a whole separate course taught in architecture theory. Uh, also in that architecture theory class, here's something he did at age 60 in 1937. This is the H Hannah Honeycomb House on the campus of uh, Stanford University. It's a hexagon shape. Here's another hexagon shape. In uh, This is out in western Pennsylvania near Falling Water, called Kentuck Knob. Here's a circular shape. This is the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. When he's 92, uh, he actually died before its completion, uh, but he designed it when he was very old in 1959. And then consider some simple geometries for what you're doing. So you can see I had an old farmhouse and I wanted the same simple geometry coming out the extension. You can see on the left the before and then the after on the right. Now, uh, back to the timeline here and the focus of this particular lecture. Uh, so his, his 20s, frankly, right in his 20s, he's working for Louis Sullivan. He's doing very well. And uh, however, he starts doing some bootleg projects that aren't known by the firm. And so it's presumably to pay the bills that he has, the private loan to Louis Sullivan. Plus, he has some extravagant tastes also. That's Frank Lloyd Wright. So he builds these, uh, gets commissions for these uh, two bootleg houses. Uh, there's actually a third also. And, um, and you can see the influence is here. It's, it's Victorian era, but he doesn't like all the frill of Victorian, including all the gingerbread, uh, typical Queen Anne uh, Victorian. So you can see the simple geometries that he's emphasizing here. Now, Louis Sullivan finds out about these bootleg projects, and he's forced to let uh, Frank Lloyd Wright go. Uh, it's argued sometimes that Louis Sullivan must have known about these houses. They were all very close uh, together to his, his home and studio. And um, uh, however, this is a big firm and Louis Sullivan has a partner, Adler, and employees. And so uh, they needed to let Frank Lloyd Wright go because of this uh, breach of contract to work just on the firm, the firm's uh, clients' houses. And designs. Uh, but frankly, Wright always referred to uh, throughout his life uh, to Louis Sullivan as his Liebermeister, his dear master. So now Frank Lloyd Wright is on his own. Uh, his first project uh, of his own practice is here, uh, the Walter H. Gale residence, also very close right next to the bootleg houses and right down the street from his home and studio. You can see more of this in the video log. Uh, my video log on the YouTube channel at time 714. And you can see some uh, some very unique features of what he's going to be well known for later on here. Of course, the simple geometries uh, we've already talked about, but now the banding of windows you can see in that turret. And also the uh, long overhangs we'll be talking about a little bit later, especially when we get into the prairie style homes a little later. We're going to talk about window banding here. Uh, 
1869, falling water. Certainly, we'll talk more about that a little later. 870 now. This is 1937. This is Taliesin West. We'll talk about that uh, whole whole uh, lecture on Taliesin East and West and the fellowship and school. Uh, this is my son talking to a girl who's in the in the fellowship in the graduate program. Uh, we got an extra tour after the regular tour of the school and areas where the students sleep. Uh, um, they were looking to potentially uh, recruit my son for graduate school. This is when he is age 83. This is a 1950 design that's called Muirhead Farm. And uh, it's in a somewhat obscure location in Hampshire, Illinois, northwest of Chicago. And uh, we got a special tour of it. This is my daughter taking a picture in the picture. So now this is from um, my interiors lecture on YouTube channel. It's also, you can find it in my, uh, in my architecture theory lectures. But the, the idea of openings and the banding of windows and the, and the principle here involved. So a window wall allows more daylight and views and it visually expands space beyond the physical boundaries. Um, and you know, you, you can weaken the corner. It also opens up the house so you can band and wrap around the corners. And so you can read on here of the, the principles involved. Uh, this is a little more on the theory too. As, as uh, an opening expands, it opens a room up to a broad vista. The large scene can dominate a space or serve as a backdrop for activities. Uh, more on banding windows. So come back and take a look at this video on Ngawas and we'll speak uh, a good deal more in other lectures about the Japanese influence on Frank Lloyd Wright, including him going and living there and designing there for a while, uh, for five years. And so the Japanese, it's uh, very much part of their design, uh, architecture, and the philosophy of life, the inside, outside of uh, the Ngawa, and how that works. Essentially a covered porch, but a usable covered porch throughout the year. Uh, this is in my own design here, so uh, I wasn't thinking specifically of Frank Lloyd Wright when I did this, but I had uh, studied him for you know a while amongst other architects and throughout my life. So this is in the year 2000, uh, you know, first study in architecture and competed in architectural competitions starting in high school uh, in the 1970s and then began college in 79. So uh, this was not a new thing. To me, a new idea, but the banding of windows, frankly, right, certainly pioneered that. So this is a project of mine. This is another project I had uh, in the late 80s, beginning of the 1990s, where I you know, renovated and put these uh, skylights in a home. I designed that and built it myself. Although the Walter H. Gale residence that he designed when he was 26 years old was the first commission of his firm that he created after leaving Adler and Sullivan. Uh, this was his, this design here, the Winslow residence, was his first major commission for a much larger sum of money. This is the Moore residence in Oak Park, Illinois. And uh, you can see this is one example where he turns away from the road. Traditionally, houses at this time or earlier faced the road with a porch and horse and buggies went by not too long before this or actually at this time also. Uh, so this, now he places the house at 90 degrees to the road and facing the sun with a large front yard. So this uh, use of natural daylighting and the sun, this will become an integral part of his organic design. We're taking note of the Japanese-inspired designs of Frank Lloyd Wright um, and drawing some conclusions about the early influences and how uh, Japanese architecture affected his designs throughout his life. Uh, here's another one of those examples, the Chauncey Williams House residence uh, 
in Lake Forest next to Oak Park. The Rollin Furbeck residence in Oak Park, Illinois was a precursor to the more mature prairie school style with the uh, more fully developed uh, aspects of the prairie school style, uh, including the uh, uh, pinwheel plane, which we'll see in the next slide here, um, the central chimney, chimney, broad low hip roof with uh, long overhanging cantilevers, uh, brick face up to the windowsill, limestone trim, symmetrical windows, uh, banding of windows, and uh, picture windows. And so here you can see the cruciform, uh, the pinwheeled planes that uh, in this design uh, will be showing up uh, later in the more mature um, around 1901 Prairie School style of Frank Lloyd Wright designs. Now I'll be coming back uh, frequently and looking at Japanese influences uh, and so in this time period you see this design here the uh, S.A. Foster residence in Chicago and you can clearly see uh, if you're familiar with Japanese architecture uh, the, the front gate uh, that you look at there um, is very similar to the uh, a Japanese Tori um, gate, uh, Shinto shrine or Shinto religion uh, symbolizing uh, the entry from the human world into the spiritual world. Also, you see Asian influence in the, the way the roof uh, gable ends extend out uh, in a point, not uh, the, the, uh, the roof line doesn't follow uh, the same distance in the eave of the uh, gable there, it, it stretches out at the top. This is the Edward R. Hills residence, another example of some Japanese inspiration. Uh, this house was paid for by uh, Mr. Moore of the house in the, in the background that you can see as a, a wedding present to his uh, daughter and uh, his future son-in-law. And here's a look at that same house from another angle, seeing the uh, roofs that uh, clearly look to be Japanese influence of Japanese influence. So uh, again, to his organic architecture, um, the American house, he says, had no sense of unity, nor sense of space, as should belong to a free people. Uh, the thing was more of a hive than a home, a box with a fuzzy lid cut up with holes to let light and air in, uh, with an especially ugly hole to go in and out. Floors were the only part of the house left plain after Queen Anne had swept past the Victorian. Queen Anne. Bowel circulation and nerves were new to buildings, all the engineering that came after the Industrial Revolution that she was born into. And then he reminisces to the simplicity of his farm life. And he says, all this seemed affectation, affectation, nonsense or profane. Uh, the first feeling was hunger for reality or sincerity. A desire for simplicity that would yield a broader, deeper comfort as organic. Organic simplicity. Ruthless but harmonious order I was taught to call nature on the farm beauty in growing things. So you see his character developing. I've already talked a little bit about this project here. Uh, many of you have already watched a whole lecture on this skeleton beneath the skin. You can click on the PDF in the YouTube here. If you come back into the PDF files, if you're watching this on YouTube, the PDF will be down below as a link. Uh, but you know, he says form and function are one. Uh, he referred to the barn and its post and beam framed interior like the skin of your hand defined by the skeleton beneath. So often my freshman architecture students, I ask them to uh, make a, a skeleton of a barn with uh, balsa wood first, uh, a design of their own, and then later uh, put the skin on the building, but to think of the skin while they're making the skeletons. 
Now we want to summarize uh, some of Frank Lloyd Wright's organic architecture, his organic design and the beginnings of it. Um, it was certainly influenced by Japanese culture and, and designs, uh, including Japanese prints that he collected and was very interested in from early on. Uh, his visit to the Japanese Phoenix Hall Pavilion in the 19, 1893 Chicago World's Fair. And then later, he'll visit and design and uh, live in Japan for five years. Uh, so you want to maybe come back, uh, or you should come back and take a look at some of these videos um, that I've listed below here on Japanese carpentry, the Japanese masters, uh, a video about a visiting apprentice actually from Canada in Japan, not accepted right away, but then earned uh, the trust of the Japanese people and became a master carpenter in Japan in recent times. And then the Ingawa, which is uh, a covered porch kind of architecture and the, and the carpentry and, and the culture surrounding that. Now, this is frankly Wright's word speaking of Japanese architecture. Uh, he, he had a, a very large ego and didn't want to admit that he was directly influenced by the Japanese. But he says, um, he's quoted as saying, the Japanese house is the closest, or uh, are, are the way of doing things was always organic. The Japanese house is the closest thing to our organic house, adapting and incorporating everything. When we speak of organic architecture, we're speaking of something more oriental than Western. Uh, my work is in that deeper philosophical sense, oriental. And then he says another quote, ancient Greece came nearest, but not very close. And since later Western civilization went too heavy Greek, uh, the West could not have easily seen an indigenous and organic architecture. Civilization based on cultural inspiration, chiefly Buddhism, could. Uh, but it is not so much faith, but the principles of Lao Tse, the Chinese philosopher. So you can see he's certainly drawing on uh, Asian influences uh, from early on, and uh, and never like the neoclassical, uh, neoclassicism, Greek and Roman revival that we spoke of earlier. So you can see some of the influences um, in what he saw in the uh, pavilion at the World's Fair and uh, then in his own designs that you see in the bottom here that we just discussed. Uh, he goes on to say that uh, sense of the organic, Japanese art knows this. The word edibori means a formative arrangement of the branches of a tree. Uh, we have no such word in English. There's a picture I took in Kyoto of a tree. Um, a closer picture of that. And they, uh, you certainly have seen with bonsai trees how they train the branches and, and guide them very, very old, hundreds of years old actually some of the bonsai trees and I'm sure this tree had some special pruning. Uh, so here's a link to uh, some Japanese uh, architecture and design and uh, travels. Uh, I was a keynote speaker in Osaka and then spent two weeks in uh, Kyoto uh, as well as flying into to Narita and taking the bullet train through to from Tokyo. Osaka. And uh, most likely you're going to hear a whole separate lecture on that. Again, we summarize the influences on his organic architecture, the Wisconsin Farms, the Unitarian love of nature, God and everything, his mother's four-bull block teaching, his father's music and preaching, his mentors, architect mentors, Conover and Silsby and Sullivan, uh, Jap Japanese things, um, and then soon we'll see arts and crafts from England and, and, and America, uh, and also soon a succession movement and from Austria and graphic uh, images, and then later social engineering with uh, Usonian House uh, initial Taliesin Fellowship.
And now that we've discussed the influences on his uh, organic design, his organic architecture, I uh, want to put it into a philosophy. So uh, he states, a sense of organic is indispensable to the architect. Knowledge of form and function lies at the root of the practice. Where else can we find the pertinent object lessons nature so readily furnishes? Then he says, by organic architecture, I mean an architecture that develops from within outward in harmony as distinguished from one that is applied from without. More on his philosophy, nature had become my Bible, grown form in realm of human spirit, a form more naturally significant of idea and purpose. And so he's opposing neoclassicism, senseless excess, uh, all the modern architects did, but he was very different than the other modern architect. Um, senseless expediences, he also opposes Victorian ornamentation uh, and compartmentalization. Right, so the open floor plan breaks the, up that uh, that he, he initi initiates in American architecture. He's seen it in Japan, Japanese architecture. I haven't been there yet, but he's seen it. Um, <clears throat> true ornament had to mean something, integral ornament. Building plasticity, like skin surface defined by skeleton. Aesthetic and structure become one. Form and function are one. Symbiotic, not one before the other. More like a yin and yang. Entry, uh, the, the compression and brace and release, that's also going to be one of the <clears throat> design principles we're going to talk about in a second. It comes after the philosophy. Um, <clears throat> and then he says, I don't build a house without predicting the end of the present social order. That's speaking much more of just the building, much more than that. So then he's defined them all here, uh, his design principles of his organic architecture, based on we first looked at the influences and all that, and then it's a philosophy. Now these are actual design pr principles. So what do you do? So, uh, and this is, he states them in order here, simplicity, true value of any work of art, few rooms, Openings as integral integral features of the structure. Excessive love of detail ruins fine things. Decoration is dangerous unless you understand it. Fixtures assimilated into the design of structure is what he wants. Furniture built in. Designs the furniture built in. Uh, there should be as many kinds of styles as there are kinds of people. Right? So he's not buying to one specific uh, genre. And he recreates himself and the designs many times throughout his life. Uh, the building should appear to grow easily from its site and be shaped to harmonize with its surrounding. Uh, that's a very harmonious or, or green kind of organic thing to do. Um, go to the war woods for color schemes. Use the soft, warm, optimistic tones of earth, earths and autumn leaves in preference to pessimistic blues, purples, or cold greens and grays. Bring out the nature of materials. Reveal the nature of wood, plaster, brick, or stone. A house that has good character stands good chance of growing more valuable as it grows older. While house in prevailing in the prevailing moon is mood is uh, mode is soon out of fashion. And uh, summing up. This is my own summary slide. I'm inserting into all of the lectures uh, based on the refinement of everything Frank Lloyd Wright said, uh, conforming to the site, um, pinwheel planes, cruciforms, broad chimneys, and long overhangs in the, in the prairie style, certainly folded plane uh, in, the, in the form, human scale, form and function are one. Simple geometries like the formal blocks, open floor plan, orchestrating the sun, destroying the box. Um, natural state of materials flowing in between inside and outside, uh, bands of windows, framing views, the Angawa, uh, compression and release technique to, to magnify the final space, um, natural materials, innovating materials, uh, warm optimistic tones, and um, uh, fixtures of furniture built in, music, music everywhere, music in the architecture itself, uh, inspirations from Japan and Italy. So, um, summing up here as we close uh, out this lecture, uh, organic architecture today. So, LEED, you learn about that in my green architectural engineering course. 
uh, and uh, it's leadership and energy and environmental design. Many architects have that uh, that uh, accreditation. In credit you accredit the individuals and you certify the buildings as um, platinum is the highest and gold and silver and bronze and certified. Um, this is you know, mostly in the U.S., but it's going worldwide now. Many countries have their own green standards that uh, they did long before the U.S. caught on with things. But Frank Lloyd Wright, he's in the very early days, way before almost anybody's doing such a thing, other than ancient Asian design. But in Western civilization, he's certainly a pioneer. Uh, Present-day green organic architecture in Japan uh, is ancient plus high tech so uh, that's where we're going uh, you can see uh, some pictures of that uh, so we're going to go now into uh, the next phase of his life we're finishing up at age 33 and here now part three will be ages 34 to 42 and then that's where the prairie style will be discussed and also some more influences from japan but then also the arts and crafts movement going on uh, at the same time as all this and the secession movement in Vienna. This is the last slide in this presentation. So uh, now uh, please do go and then look at this video. It's on my YouTube channel, as well as the link here for your PDF. You can link on it. If you're looking at this presentation on YouTube, there's a PDF link below. And uh, take a look up until time 1851. Uh, 18 minutes and 51 minutes or 51 seconds in uh, to see a review and more information uh, on the uh, sites or the designs that we uh, discussed in this lecture. And the two references you see me holding in this picture here one is the AIA Guide to Chicago, and the other is the store catalog of all of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright built designs. And I'm discussing the two of them cross or uh, correlating the references and discussing within the uh, video. So please look at that and then also come back and uh, click on the links and look at some of the other things within this lecture.